you. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, before we begin, I wish to acknowledge that we are meeting on the traditional and unceded territory of the Kakai First Nation and all other First Village peoples on whose land we live, we learn, we pray, and we do our work. I am so excited to introduce my friend Eileen, um, who is a young adult author. Um, I know Eileen because I am, I was, until Christy wrote me into being on the PCTLA executive, I was a loyal volunteer of the Surrey International Writers Conference, which Eileen is on the board. Not anymore. Not anymore, or she was on the board. She was. And um, she goes every year. And we kind of bonded over knitting mm -hmm. and um, the movie Sixteen Candles. <laughs> <laughs> and I do, every time I watch it, I do um, tweet about it. And then Eileen generally tweets back. And sometimes we have to watch it and tweet tweet at the same time. But um, I am really excited for you to hear about her writing process. Uh, we're gonna, we've got three books. Um, she's written many more books, but the three, her three books here are With Malice, um, The Hanging Girl, or it might have a different name. What's her name? You have uh, One Lie Too Many. Yes. One Lie Too Many. And um, you, owe, you, owe you Owe Me a Murder, which is her newest one. So. I'm so excited to have Eileen here and uh, welcome. Yeah. So thanks for having me. This is my happy place is libraries. Uh, so I thought it would be interesting to first sort of talk about how did I become a writer because it has a nice librarian connection. So I figure you guys will like that. Uh, so the very first thing that I can probably point to is I come from a family of storytellers. And in fact, when I teach writing, one of the things that people often say to me is like, I don't know if I'm any good. And I'm like, don't worry about if you're good because you can get better. Worry about whether or not you're a storyteller. <laughs> and people are either storytellers, I think, or in some ways they're not. So I was always that person that I got with my high school friends and somebody on the following Monday would be like, so then we all went, Eileen, you tell it. <laughs> and so then I would sort of retell the story. And I think that comes from my grandmother. So my grandmother uh, is Irish. Uh, so if you like the Celtic heritage at all, they are a nation of oral storytellers. And I grew up hearing about her immigration from Ireland, how she met my grandfather on the boat from Ireland, and various stories about all of that. So I kind of grew up with that. Part of that is then I have a family of readers. <laughs> uh, so I always liked books and going to the library and being surrounded with that. Now, one story that I actually have no memory of, so apologize to teachers in the room, but is my second grade teacher. So in second grade, we were required to cut a picture out of a magazine, and then we were supposed to practice writing sentences about it. So everybody else was doing things like, the girl has on a red shirt, the boy is playing with a ball. And I was the only one that turned my entire thing into a story complete with the word psychiatrist, <laughs> spelled phonetically. So you knew that phonics were a thing <laughs> at the time, so it's spelled completely phonetically. And at the very bottom of it, my English teacher put, I'm sure someday you'll be an author, I am. Wow. So my parents saved that, along with creepy things like my baby teeth, which is, mm -hmm. I guess if my mom ever wants to make a voodoo doll, that's what's the purpose of that. <laughs> um, but when I actually published my first book, my parents had it framed up and sent to me. So it actually hangs in my office as a frame piece. Uh, the funny story that goes with that is I was telling my editor uh, at the time about this and they were like, oh my god, that's a great way to get some promotion because as any writer knows, writing the book is only the first part of it. The second part is getting anyone to actually ever hear that you wrote a book. <laughs> So we wanted for all this promotion and they thought, oh, there's nothing that like news shows like better than teacher inspires students. So we hunted down my second grade teacher. <laughs> now I want to point out um, that she, her name was Sister Melvina. She was a nun, went to Catholic school, God help me. And Sister Melvina was ancient when I had her in second grade. So she had moved into like a near calcified state by the time that I wrote my first book. She was in an old age home out in the middle of nowhere, Indiana at that time. So the publisher actually flew me out there and then I had to drive in a van for two and a half hours up to this old age home. 
um, where we arrived, there was a local news station there that had, was going to be doing a live feed and it had taken us a long time to get there. So they're like, we don't have a lot of time. We're just going to go in. We're going to sit down. So as soon as I sat down, the very first thing that I saw is my English teacher who had no memory of me at all, the poor woman. She didn't actually remember being an English teacher either for that record. And she spent the entire TV interview talking about her bunions and her love of butterscotch pudding. So I have a wonderful TV news interview <laughs> where I'm holding up my book and she's talking about pudding. So if you're going to thank a teacher, you mm -hmm. should thank them much earlier <laughs> is the moral of that story. <laughs> Um, so I actually have no memory of that uh, homework assignment. I have no memory of any of that. Someone else filed in. Yes, I see that. Um, but I do actually have a very clear memory of a library thing. So every week we would go to the library and my parents are also big readers. So everybody was responsible for checking out the big giant stack of books. So one week I was in the library, I picked out my various books. I was 11 at the time. I actually went back and figured this out. So I was 11. My parents were taking a long time. So I wandered out of the children's section and into the adult section of the library where I noticed a book on display that was called Salem's Lot by Stephen King. Oh. <laughs> and for reasons that are unclear to me, I thought, well, that looks really quite interesting. <laughs> and I placed it upon my stack of Nancy Drew and Encyclopedia Browns. And I trundled off downstairs to check them out, to which the librarian said, no, you can't check out that book. And I was like, eh? and she was like, it's a nasty book. It's a nasty, nasty book. So clearly she also didn't know children because I had been like mildly interested in the book <laughs> until that point. And upon the point of hearing that it was a truly nasty, nasty book, I was insanely interested in reading the book. So I was charged to go find my mom who came and looked at it. And my parents are very open-minded, especially about anything to do with learning. So my mom said, you can read it if you want, but it's going to be really scary. And I remember feeling like insulted. <laughs> like I was like, I'm 11. Like I know the difference between make-believe and real life. And my mom was like, if you want to read it, you can read it. So I took the book and I checked it out. Um, and in case you've never read Salem's Lot. It's uh, vampires. Um, they are very not twilight vampires. They don't want to hug or kiss you or watch you gently while you sleep. They want to eat you. Uh, and that book absolutely terrified me. Like I can remember the absolute dread that I felt. I slept with the lights on for months after that. Um, but what fascinated me and still fascinates me to this day is I knew it was made up. Like I actually did understand it was imaginary. I knew that, I mean, they, on the back side it says fiction. This guy, this Stephen King, whoever he was, was admitting that he made it up. And yet I still felt fear. And I just remember thinking that that was some kind of source of magic, that you could make somebody feel a real thing. So I always find it interesting, like when I do school talks and I talk to the kids, I'm like, has anyone ever cried in a book? Um, and some of them will admit it, some won't. Have you ever had a book boyfriend or a girlfriend? And some people are like, yeah, okay, kind of, right? Um, so I think it's that thing where you know it's not real. You know it's not a real relationship. You know that nothing you think or feel is going to change. So that time when you're reading the book and you're like, no, don't, don't don't do that thing, like whatever it is, don't do it. Now, oh, they're gonna do it, right? And then you turn the page, ah, oh, like, like it was ever going to change just because you were upset. I just knew that I wanted to do that. I wanted to make things up in a way that made people feel real things. So I started writing <laughs> um, and I wrote for a long time. So in addition to, I think, having a love of stories and a love of books and any of those things, I think you need to be one part delusional <laughs> because writing is not a career for everybody. You have to really like rejection. I figured this is why I hated <laughs> high school and why I like, I was that kid who was picked on in high school. It prepared me really well to become a writer at some point in my life. I think if I had been popular in the prom queen, I wouldn't have made it. So it helped me a lot that I got picked on and I was like, ah, 
I've been picked on by worse than you, right? Kirkus, I'm not ashamed of you. So having some level of sort of delusionary capacity, especially because when you tell people that you want to be a writer or an author, people don't, believe. it's sort of like you said, I'd like to be a princess. And it's like, well, that's nice. Um, I always got asked, you know, but, but what's your real job going to be? Um, my parents are both very pragmatic people. So my dad's line all the way through university is last I heard the English factories laying off. <laughs> Thanks dad. Okay. <laughs> so that was certainly for me, something that you just have to believe in that dream. And that's why, again, when I talk to people, the biggest difference in my experience between people who have published and people who have not published is persistence. So people, first you have to have the persistence to finish a book, um, which the vast majority of people don't do. People are always talking about, someday I'm going to write a book, um, but they often don't do it. There's certainly the story that Margaret Atwood shares about being at a party at one point, and this fellow came up to her, and he's a neurosurgeon, and he said, oh yeah, when I retire, I think I'm gonna write a book. And she said, oh, that's so funny, when I retire, I think I'll do neurosurgery. <laughs> um, that just somehow it's just this idea like, oh, if I just had the time, I'd just write a book. Um, but it's actually quite hard to get all the way through a manuscript, particularly because when you're starting out, no one cares if you finish it or not. And it's often really hard to figure out how you're actually going to get to the end of things. So for me, when I started writing, I had a vast number of books that I started and never finished. And that was because I had this common problem where I would get this amazing idea and then I would sit down to write it and my amazing idea became a really bad story. <laughs> And I couldn't figure that out. So I would be like, oh, it must not have been that good of an idea. So then I would jettison and I would be like, now I have a really good idea. And so I would start and of course, then that idea would die an ugly and slow death. Um, I may be alone in that. <laughs> so it's very relatable. <laughs> yeah, it's something I think a lot of people see. So you have to sort of persist because you have to get to the end in order to be able to fix what you have. Uh, so Nora Roberts, who's a romance writer, one of her big sayings is you can't fix a blank page, um, which I repeat all the time, because if you have something written, you can go back and you can make it better. You can figure out why it's not working. But if you have nothing on the page, there's nothing that you can do about it. One of the other stories that I share with kids, because I think they find it somewhat interesting and it's fun to do as sort of a group round, as I will say, how much I always loved writing and how I tried and I didn't finish a book, but finally I decided I was going to do it. So I sat down and I took, took me two years to write a, a book and I wrapped that book up and because I believed in myself and because I did the work. Do you know what happened when I sent that book off to New York? And there's always a kid in the front row who goes, you got published. I'm like, no, <laughs> I got rejected. I got rejected by every single agent and publishing a house all throughout New York. And they're like, oh, I'm like, but I didn't give up. So I sat down and I figured, well, I have to learn how to write a better book. So I wrote a second novel and I took some classes and I got a little bit better. And so do you know what happened? Because I stuck with it and I worked really hard and I made myself better at it. They're starting to catch on and be like, you got published? And I'd be like, no, <laughs> I got rejected. But then I decided to work harder. I took another class. I took a great class if people have ever had Ivan Coyote uh, in their classroom. Uh, at that time, Ivan was teaching at Cal College and they pulled me aside and said, you're really good. Uh, you should be sending your stuff out. And in fact, Ivan gave me the best publishing advice uh, in my entire life, which is also the best advice for life in general, um, because Ivan is smart in that way. Um, they sat me down and they said, why aren't you sending out your stuff? And I said, well, like I've sent some stuff out and I got rejected and I don't know, like if I send this out and it gets rejected, like how am I gonna feel about that? And I haven't said, you know you're already not published, right? Mm -hmm. So I figure the worst thing that will happen to you is you still won't be published. And that for me, like it sounds so simple, but it was this light bulb moment that, oh right, like it's not just going to happen, I'm gonna have to put myself out there if I want that to happen. Uh, and that's something that I, I really want 
kids and teens to hear, which is if you want something, if you want to be a doctor or you want to be an astronaut or you want to write computer games or whatever it is that you want to do, I have no idea if you'll reach that goal. There's so many things that happen with that. But I know for 100%, if you quit, you will not do it. You absolutely have to be willing to try. So I sent out that third book. And does anyone know what happened then? Did you get rejected? Get I got rejected. <laughs> yeah. So, and then I say, well, do you know what I did then? And they all say, you wrote another book. And I say, no, you're pretty stupid. I quit. I'd written three full length novels. I had sent them out to every place. I was just getting rejected over and over and over again. I figured I had tried as much as I could. And I actually stopped writing for about two years. But there was a problem. And the problem is, I actually really like it. I like making stuff up. I like making stories. And I would still have this moment where I would be like, oh, that would make a great story. No, I'm not writing it. <laughs> right? Um, I took up knitting in that time period, so I learned to do other things. Uh, but I didn't know what to do. I wanted to get back to it. So I decided to write another book. And do you know what happened to that? I can say you got published. I'm like, no, that's how you know this is not an inspirational talk <laughs> because that would be a much better story. Um, that book also got rejected. But at that point, I was getting different rejections. So I was getting rejections that were much more detailed where people were saying, this is working really well, but this part isn't, those kinds of things. Um, so I wrote another book. And they're like, you got rejected? Like, no, I actually sold that book. That was the first book that I sold, which is in 2006. Um, we sold that book in nine different countries. We sold the film rights to that book to New Line Cinema. And all of a sudden, I was off to the races. And I thought I had arrived. And at that time, my book had been out, I want to think it was no more than two or three months. The publisher called me and said, we're not going to do that line of books anymore. It's been great working with you. We wish you all the best. Goodbye. Mm -hmm. um, so I was back at ground zero. Mm -hmm. it was the first book I wrote was called Unpredictable, which was an adult romantic comedy. And it was at the time that oh, Chicklet, that. yeah, Chicklet was all the rage at that time, uh, but it was dying, which is what happened. So I came out right when they were like, you know what, we're not going to do romantic comedy anymore. So thanks. Um, so my agent at the time, which was my literary agent, pulled me aside and she said, I think you'd have a great voice for YA, um, which I didn't even know what YA was, first off. Um, second of all, I thought there's no way that I can write YA because I don't have kids. Um, but in some ways, I think that makes it easier for me <laughs> to write YAs because I don't have kids. So I don't necessarily think through a lens of my own children. I just think in terms of what I find interesting. And what I have discovered is while there are many things that have changed, so much has not. The same things that I went through when I was a teenager are the same things that teens are going through today with the exception of they are far more likely to videotape it and have to live with the evidence long after. So there are definite differences, some good, some bad. Um, but in terms of that, trying to figure out who you are, trying to kind of strike out in your own family, all of those things are exactly the same. So being persistent is a very good skill set for an author to have. Uh, I won't share names on this, but I happen to know several authors who were New York Times bestsellers, who'd made a six-figure deal on a book, and then the editor's been like, yeah, we don't think we want your next book. And then the next book they sell is for $7,000. So I think there's sort of this impression that you struggle, struggle, and then you've made it and you're making coin and you're living on a beach somewhere and adopting cats and writing books or something like that. But it's not usually that story. Uh, for a lot of writers, there's a lot of up and down. So they're doing great, they have some contracts, and then maybe things drop off for a bit. They have a book that wins an award, they think, aha, um, and then the next book, the sales figures don't, don't happen for that. So you have to be someone who's really comfortable with kind of reinventing yourself, with picking up, uh, and being willing to keep going. Having said that, you can actually make a living as a writer. <laughs> um, that is what I do now, like that is my job. Um, 
I live on my own. I have my own condo that's paid for and all that, like I can support myself with what I make with my writing. Um, but just to be aware that it is it's an up and down field. And so to kind of be willing to flex with that uh, goes a long way. So being comfortable with that. <clears throat> I wanted to do just a short reading from one of my books, and then I'm gonna jump into sort of like where ideas come from in the writing process. Um, but I'm gonna read it from my book, which is You Owe Me a Murder, which is my most recent book that came out. Um, this is my homage to Strangers on a Train, if people like any of the Patricia Highsmith, um, Alfred Hitchcock kinds of things, this is my sort of nod to that. Uh, and this basically is exactly like what happens in Strangers on a Train. So the main character, Kim, uh, is on a plane because it's now the 2000s. So she's on a plane, not a train. Uh, and she's on her way to a school trip in London. And uh, she's not very happy to be going on this school trip because her boyfriend has broken up with her just before the school trip. So she's now trapped on this overseas program with him and his new girlfriend. So she discloses on a plane to the stranger sitting next to her <laughs> This situation and that person is sharing with her her upsetness with her mother and so they've snuck some alcohol from the bar cart and they have this funny conversation about how we could pull off the perfect murder you should kill my boyfriend I'll kill your mom ha 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 and then her boyfriend uh, ends up pushed in front of a train and is dead <laughs> so in the part that I'm reading she has hunted down <laughs> the stranger, Nikki, and they are actually meeting in a pub uh, in London. And so she's here to confront her. Nikki raised one eyebrow as if I disappointed her, as though I were a puppy who'd peed on her floor. I'm simply trying to introduce you to something new. That's what you said you wanted, to tackle fears, to experience new things. Isn't that the point of travel after all? Meeting people, expanding your horizons? She waved her hands to encompass the bar. No, tell me what's important. Tell me your real name. Does it matter? I took a sip of the drink to have something to do with my hands. The mix of spice, pine, and bitter washed over my palate. The cocktail tasted strong, like what it might be like to suck on a car air freshener. It matters to me. Names are weird, aren't they? They define a person. I mean, if you hear a girl's name Gertrude, you get a picture in your mind of what she's like, don't you? Much different than a Penelope. So given how important names are, isn't it rather silly that our parents give us names instead of us choosing them? You're basically an unformed blob when they give you a name. They select one that's based on who they want you to be, not what fits you. It seems to me that a person should get to pick their own name once they reach something like 14 or 16. You know who you are at that point. I always saw myself as a Nikki, much more than the name my parents gave me. She took another drink. You're another perfect example. I wouldn't picture you as a Kim. Too pretty, not serious enough. Kimberly. She drew my name out, somehow managing to fill it with extra syllables. I'd never liked my name either, but I didn't want to give Nikki the satisfaction of knowing she was right. Kimberly had been my mom's favorite name, and it didn't fit me at all. What sort of name do you think suits me? I asked. Nikki clapped her hands. Oh, this will be fun. She rubbed her chin, regarding me very carefully. I think it should be a touch old fashioned. You're an ancient soul, not too girly, not too butch. Irene, maybe. She shook her head, dismissing the idea as quickly as she said it, then whacked her, her hand down on the table, making our drinks jump. I've got it, Ada. She waited for me to respond. You know her, right? Ada Lovelace? She was a countess way back in the 1800s, a mathematician. I know who she was. She was one of the creators of the Babbage Analytical Engine. Nikki nodded. Exactly, the first computer. Now, when you think about it, that's perfect for you. She looked proud of herself. Yes, you're definitely an Ada. I'd change your name if I were you. You're a completely different woman as an Ada. Her hand slitted through the air. It will alter your entire destiny. Meaning Nikki had already changed my destiny enough. You still haven't told me your real name, she sighed. You're focusing on the wrong things. I lowered my voice. And would the right thing be that you murdered Connor? Of course not. That's already done and dealt with. No point in chatting that up. I blinked. Was she completely insane? I thought she would deny it, but she didn't. She acted as if it was no big deal, as if we were discussing what we had for lunch or the score of a football game. 
There was nothing in her voice that hinted at panic or desperation. Then what should I be focused on? How you're gonna kill my mother? My ears began to ring and I could feel the rush of blood inside my head, drowning out voices of the other people in the bar. What did you say? You owe me a murder. Dun, dun, dun. Which is where the title comes from, <laughs> in case you didn't get that. Can we take a little break? Yes. Um, it's a, mostly a techno technology issue. Yep. Really a technical break. I, about, uh, if anybody is watching, <laughs> under five minutes. <laughs> Okay. Please help yourself to more snacks. Tea, more cake. Snack, <laughs> cake. It's, uh, it's, interesting. it's interesting with all the authors that we've had come visit uh, the students are great when you come and they hear your story, they have to come over. Not another author saying.